Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. HBO just confirmed one of their next Game of Thrones prequels will be Aegon's Conquest, confirming a bunch of our theories. We all thought they would do it eventually. They just announced a writer. It's Matt Tomlin, who just did the Batman and the Batman 2, working with George R. Martin. So we'll break it all down. Aegon the Conqueror. Aegon. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. Of course, I'll be doing videos for all this. We'll probably be doing House of the Dragon and other Game of Thrones spinoffs and prequels till we're like 100 years old. It'll be fantastic. I can't wait to talk about House of the Dragon, A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones when I'm 100 years old. During the current episodes on House of the Dragon, they've actually recontextualized a lot of the lore around Aegon's conquest, why it happened, what he did during the conquest, and how that connects with what's happening during the events of Game of Thrones later in the timeline. One of the reasons why it seems like they're retconning things is because George R. R. Martin, who helped them develop House of the Dragon, like he's helping them write episodes, said that most of the Fire and Blood book that we're actually adapting for the events of House of the Dragon was written by maesters of the third parties who just weren't privy to all the information. In the way that Viserys explained it to Rhaenyra, it was a secret that was passed down from king to successor, and eventually it was lost. So that's why during the events of the main series, the only way that the characters start learning about it is through these ancient texts that were thought lost inside the Citadel. From my blood come the prince that was promised, and his will be the song of ice and fire. It also sounds like that's how Rhaegar learned about the prophecy later too, before he died, is that he found it by combing through the citadel. So quick history, the Aegon who conquered the Seven Kingdoms was first of his name, Aegon Targaryen. He had a couple main nicknames that the realm later gave him, the Conqueror for obvious reasons, and the Dragon. So anytime on the show or during the events of Game of Thrones when you hear people refer to themselves or to other Targaryens as the Dragon, like, oh, you seem like the Dragon today, they're likening them to Aegon the Conqueror. The way that later members of their family and the realm viewed him is sort of like a superstar. So as you'd expect, over like the 300 plus years after his conquest in their history ruling over Westeros up to the events of the main show, ending with Jon Snow, many, many members of their family were named Aegon. For instance, on the show right now, we have Aegon II, they call him second of his name. If Jon Snow had actually sat on the Iron Throne, he would have been called Aegon VI. Aegon V is actually the younger brother of Maester Aemon. And here's where we start with the conquest. There's like some important backstory. Aegon the Conqueror was born on Dragonstone many years after the Targaryens had fled ancient Valyria and the doom had happened. They had taken five dragons with them when they sailed for Dragonstone, but only three survived to the time of Aegon. Valyrian the Black Dread, who's already died before the events of House of the Dragon, and the two dragons that his sisters eventually rode, Vagar, who we just saw on the show, ridden by Lena Valyrian, and Meraxes, who was ridden by his other sister Rhaenys. On House of the Dragon, Princess Rhaenys, the queen who never was, is named after Aegon's sister Rhaenys. During House of the Dragon, we've recently learned from Viserys that Aegon was born with the ability to dragon dream, just like he was, and now we've learned that Helena Targaryen has his daughter with Alicent. The last ring has no legs at all. You will have a dragon one day. He'll have to close an eye. Those are dragon dreams that she's reciting there about two different members of their family. The one where she says the last ring will have no legs is about Aegon II. I don't want to explain exactly what it means because it's kind of a spoiler and I think that they're going to pay it off in a future season. The other one's about Aemond Targaryen and when she says he'll have to close an eye, that's all about him claiming a dragon. Like he'll claim a dragon but he has to close an eye to do it. Dragon dreams are basically the gift of prophecy, visions of the future that are specific to the Targaryen family or people of Valyrian descent. Daenerys Targaryen also has a version of dragon dreams on the main show in the House of the Undying, seeing visions of her future, but not totally understanding what they mean at the time. And even though people mostly think about the conquest when they think about Aegon, that wasn't the first war that he actually fought in. On the House of the Dragon show recently in this past episode, they actually referenced the Century of Blood, and that was about the hundred years after the Doom of Valyria, where everyone in Essos was fighting over the territory that was left in the wake of the Doom. Aegon the Conqueror used Balerion the Black Dread to aid Pentos, Lys, some of these other cities in the east over here, which is what the prince from the east here was talking to Daemon about. Your ancestor Aegon the Conqueror aided us in the Century of Blood, won't you do it again now in present day? So that took place way before the actual War of Conquest. But at some point when this was happening, Aegon Targaryen eventually had the dragon dream about the Long Night and someone from his bloodline eventually stopping it. He called it A Song of Ice and Fire, which is the title of George R. R. Martin's main novel series, and he had the prophecy etched on the Valyrian dagger which he had come into possession of using Valyrian pyromancers. They're kind of like the ancient version of the pyromancers guild in present day. They're the ones who eventually will create wildfire. 
I think the idea is that the Valyrian Pyromancers eventually morphed into the Pyromancers Guild, and at some point they just lost a lot of the knowledge of ancient Valyria, or it wasn't passed on, or it was destroyed during some big conflict. We've learned over time that a lot of prophecies, a lot of things wind up getting lost in rebellions and insurrections. Viserys also says that they don't have records of where the Valyrian dagger came from before Aegon came into possession of it. He probably got it from his father before him, but he does confirm that it came from ancient Valyria before that. It sounds like what eventually happened is that after he etched the prophecy on it, when he would tell the prophecy to each new successor and the successor after that, they would pass the dagger along to each new king. And I think that's why Viserys walks around everywhere with the dagger on his belt. So we're still many years before the actual conquest. When Aegon actually had the dragon dream, Westeros at that point was full of many petty kings, each ruling over their seven different kingdoms, each warring with each other on the regular. And Aegon knew that unless they all united under a single banner, the realm would never be able to stop the Long Night. So he decided the only way to achieve that would be if he conquered the seven kingdoms and essentially forced them to work together. But remember, he had no idea when the Long Night would actually come, and none of his successors did either. Each one thought that it could happen at any moment. So in addition to all the infighting in the realm that would happen across the many years, across the many Targaryen kings, you have to imagine that each one that knew about the prophecy was low-grade paranoid about that in the background. On the House of the Dragon show, we've seen the upgraded depiction of the famous map table. It's the same map table that Daenerys uses later in Game of Thrones. They just kind of reskinned it and made it look a little bit cooler during House of the Dragon, but it's meant to be the exact same one. Aegon is the one who created that table, and he had it done before he had the dragon dream. So when he was younger, dealing with all the problems in the Century of Blood, he had taken his dragon, Balerion the Black Dread, also flying all over Westeros, so we spent a lot of time visiting the main realms. It was during this period that he had the map table commissioned. The actual War of Conquest took about two years, and then a little bit of time after that, before he was actually crowned king of the Six Kingdoms in Dorne. I'll talk about that in a second, too. Technically, he did not conquer Dorne. But after his conquest, they changed the way the calendar works, and they would refer to dates before the conquest as B.C. and after conquest as A.C. When he completed the conquest, he was crowned king by the High Septon of that day. His crown was made of Valyrian steel. It still exists during the events of House of the Dragon, like the episodes we're watching. During House of the Dragon Episode 9, when the Greens usurped the Iron Throne from Rhaenyra and crowned Aegon II, king of Westeros, they used Aegon the Conqueror's Valyrian steel crown to do it, so on the show, he's wearing that all the time. While Rhaenyra is wearing her father's crown, which had previously been created by King Jaehaerys after he took the Iron Throne. You could do like a whole separate video just about the details in the separate crowns and why they were made the way they were made, like why they're designed in specific ways. So I'll probably get into that when we get to House of the Dragon Season 2 episodes. Everyone's always talking about the Iron Throne. That was made from the melted swords of all the people during the War of Conquest who refused to bend the knee. He would take his and his sister's dragons around to each of the seven kingdoms in the different realms and demand that they bend the knee. It's not clear if he revealed the prophecy of the Long Night to each of the seven different realms when he was trying to conquer them. It sounds like he did not, though. Like the way that Viserys talks about it, it was meant to be a secret that only each new successor learned about. And when Aegon literally started the War of Conquest by flying his dragons, sailing his troops from Dragonstone to the mainland, the place where he made landfall is at King's Landing, but at the time, the area didn't have a name. They just called it Aegon Fort because Aegon turned the area into a small town for his forces and built a small wooden fort there. Later, when he finished the war and was crowned king, they moved the capital to this area in Aegon Fort and renamed it King's Landing. Before that, previously for many, many thousands of years, back to the time of the First Men, Old Town had always been the biggest port town, so that was always viewed as sort of like the unofficial capital of Westeros. The Red Keep that's become so famous, the actual city of King's Landing as you see it today, like the larger city, didn't get built till many, many years later, like Magor built the Red Keep. So for most of Aegon's life, he ruled from that smaller fort that they tore down to build the Red Keep. The most famous battles during the War of Conquest were the Burning of Harrenhal, the Conquest of the Stormlands, the Conquest of the Westerlands, and the Reach, and the Invasion of Dorne. There were only a couple of realms that actually bent the knee. One of his first engagements was the actual burning of Harrenhal. So Harrenhor ruled over the Riverlands, this area here at the time, and it took about 40 years to build the castle of Harrenhal. It's literally the largest castle in all of Westeros, way bigger than the Red Keep. What wound up happening is that the day that the castle was completed was also the day that Aegon made landfall. And when Harrenhor refused to bend the knee, Aegon took Balerion the Black Dread, melted the castle, so that's why they call it the burning of Harrenhal, and forever after, people said that there was a curse on Harrenhal. Because each new lord that would take possession of the castle in these lands would meet some untimely fate, like they would die some mysterious but gruesome death. 
the latest being Harwin Strong and his father Lionel Strong, and that same curse continues to the events of the Game of Thrones series later in the timeline. During the conquest of the Stormlands, that actually led to the creation of House Baratheon. Oris Baratheon, the first member of their house, was actually Aegon's bastard brother by his father, so they were actually good friends growing up. And after they conquered the Stormlands, he gave them to Oris Baratheon and basically named him Lord Baratheon. Many years later into the events of the main series, the Baratheons eventually intermarried with the Targaryens back and forth across the years. So for instance, Robert Baratheon had Targaryen blood in his veins through his grandmother, who herself was a legitimate full Targaryen. So he actually had a small claim to the Iron Throne after Robert's Rebellion, which is why the realm were so quick to support his claim to the Iron Throne. Like, oh, well, you're part Targaryen, so you kind of belong on the Iron Throne. He would have been like Rhaegar's cousin. One of the major battles against the Lannisters of that day was called the Field of Fire. They did a version of that during Game of Thrones Season 7, where you see Daenerys basically roast Jaime Lannister's loot train. There wasn't an actual battle. Aegon basically just took Balerion the Black Threat and burned a giant portion of their army, and then they bent the knee after that. The invasion of Dorne is important because during Aegon's conquest, it was unsuccessful. He did not conquer Dorne. It wasn't until like way later in the timeline, even during the events of House of the Dragon right now that we're watching, Dorne has not been conquered yet. So it's still the Six Kingdoms in Dorne during House of the Dragon. A few of the realms that actually did bend the knee and didn't require any real fighting at the time were Torn Stark, King of the North at the time, and Shara Aaron, Ruler of the Vale at the time. And it's important to note that after the actual War of Conquest and after Aegon was crowned, that wasn't the last war or battle that he fought in the Seven Kingdoms. The Maesters recorded that he and his sisters Visenya and Rhaenys spent most of the rest of their lives on their dragons or going around the slow way, putting down small rebellions and dealing with each of the seven different kingdoms. So it wasn't like he conquered Westeros and then it was all quiet in the realm for hundreds of years later. After Aegon died, he would have passed the prophecy of A Song of Ice and Fire to his son Aenys, who then ruled and was viewed by most as a weak king. The realm weren't huge fans of his. Because knowledge of the prophecy was passed down from Jaehaerys to Viserys, I'm also assuming that Maegor probably knew the prophecy too, because there was a lot of infighting in the Battle of Succession that took place when Aenys and Maegor were alive. So there were probably a couple of members in their family that knew the prophecy at that time. And then obviously we covered the events of House of the Dragon. Now the House of the Dragon showrunner right now had previously mentioned that they would just use the House of the Dragon banner to cover different time periods from the Fire and Blood book in Targaryen history, one of them possibly being Aegon's Conquest. So it's not totally clear if the new Aegon Conquest series is going to be part of that or if it's a totally separate thing like Night of the Seven Kingdoms. What they might do is just put a completely different creative crew on Aegon's Conquest and let House of the Dragon go on to like a completely different time period. And it sounds like they're using these other prequels to sort of thread in between House of the Dragon seasons. So for instance, right now they're actually getting ready to film Game of Thrones, Night of the Seven Kingdoms. That sounds like it's going to release sometime between one of the final seasons of House of the Dragon. That'll bridge the gap until they're ready to premiere this Game of Thrones Aegon Conquest series. That might not be till 2026, 2027. It just depends on how quickly they get these other shows out in the rest of House of the Dragon seasons. But everyone post all your fan casts for the main characters. It's going to be a completely new cast, obviously. We should get a brand new House of the Dragon Season 2 trailer pretty soon as well. Season 2 will premiere this summer. And I just did a video for the last trailer. Click here for that. And click here for that Game of Thrones Night of the Seven Kingdoms trailer video to learn what's going on with that series. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.